warm welcome, please, for Florian Meyer. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for welcoming. Thanks for having me here. Um, as I uh, learned, you already heard so much of Biotope already that I probably can skip half of my slides. Um, well, someone uh, representing a car manufacturer being on stage speaking about digital enterprises, uh, where will that end up? Um, part of why I'm here is to show you that BMW already is and becoming even more a digital enterprise. To do so, we identified four key fields we are focusing on. It's autonomous. Do you see? Oh, yeah. Sorry. It's autonomous, connected, electric, and shared. You, might, you may have heard of that field already. Um, we refer to them under the abbreviation of ACES. Let me walk you through those fields. First, autonomous driving. How does autonomous driving work? You see here a picture of an um, autonomous car. You can imagine there are several sensors, leader, radar, camera, GPS, many more. That unfortunately doesn't suffice. This is uh, the, the car to uh, successfully drive autonomous needs to more, needs to know more than it actually gets delivered by its sensors. The car constantly asks itself questions like, where am I laterally to my lane? What lies ahead of me? What is uh, beyond what my sensors can see? Therefore, um, we need some more information, as I said. This is what we call the HD, the high definition map. The high definition kind of acts as an additional sensor which answers that question for the vehicle. So how does one classify the way to autonomous driving? You might have heard of the steps or of the levels of autonomous driving. You have the number, the level zero. That's basically just your random old car that doesn't assist you in any way. You have level one, which we call assistant, assisted, where you have longitudinal or transverse guidance. Number two, level two, adds on top of level one the traffic control. Level three is where the car already is uh, partly automated, but you need as a driver to be able to take over in a very short time frame because the car will say, I cannot handle that situation, please take over. Number four, is where you don't have any uh, takeover requests. The car is fully automated. Uh, the there might be situations where the vehicle gets stuck, but the vehicle will always be able to end up in a safe mode for you. Number five is where there actually is no driver. There is no interaction possibilities, meaning that the vehicle is taking over responsibility from the driver. What does that mean in terms of information? The higher the level of autonomy, the higher the need for connectivity. To picture the backend perspective of connectivity and autonomous driving, let's have a look at our vision digital. In previous presentations, you already heard the um, term of the digital twin, which for us 
is the digital car. As we are coming from the digital enterprise, that's quite matching. Um, you already see in these uh, images some uh, possible forms of connections, which is another example for the importance of connectivity, for example, car to X communication, for example, to traffic lights, or car to car communication. Another form of connectivity, however, is corporations. Me being here today at the Open Groups conference is one form of cooperation. On the other hand, we have some very specific cooperations for, uh, across the industry. We already spoke about um, the, HD map for, the HD map, for example. Also, the different sensors require quite some cooperation with other partners. As you can imagine, if connectivity is so important for the vehicles, it's also important to have the uh, specific infrastructure to enable the vehicle to connect with the backend or with any other devices. And on the other hand, I guess you might agree with me, if you are in an autonomous car, you would even want to, you want even more to have it tested under real world circumstances to make sure it works, which is the last uh, form of cooperation on this side. Coming to the next field of the ACES strategy, which is electric, due to the topic of the conference, I won't go into detail here. Uh, we see here some figures that, in my opinion, speak for themselves. 15% of our drive now fleet, for example, have been electrified. That means 2,500 uh, sorry, tons of CO2 saved, and means 16 million kilometers driven electric which in my opinion is quite uh, impressive. Before we come to the uh, last field of the ACES strategy, let's talk about the motivation for that field. The motivation for us, on the one hand, is digitalization. <clears throat> which uh, after covering the last more technical fields of ACES is, in my opinion, quite self-explanatory that they um, already influence the uh, ideas we have here. But what does digitalization mean for us in that context? According to what experts say, in the next 15 years, there might be more changes than in the last 100 years, in terms of mobility especially. That means we have people moving closer together. We have changes in customer demands. We have new players that have not been in the mobility market before. And we have value shifting. People consider not owning their own car as one of their goals, but considering just sharing a car to, uh, together with many other people. How do we act on those changes? We have, of course, as we always have, new vehicle concepts. We already spoke uh, about connectivity, here especially about intelligent transport systems. We already covered autonomous driving. And we will now come to the shared or to the mobility services and connectivity. Have a look at this picture of the uh, mobility market, which, of course, is changing. Today, we are somewhere to the left. We have uh, a certain amount uh, of the need for mobility covered by public transport. We have the individual transport, where you can picture us, for example. And on the other hand, we have on-demand transport which in the past has been mostly taxis, and uh, we have some new business uh, models or some new offerings there. You have, for example, car sharing, you have ride pooling, you have ride hailing, uh, and all the different possibilities that are now slowly coming up and even more increasing. 
this is um, some of the uh, big players that are, can act as an example for the, for the um, shares of the market. And as you can see, according to what forecasts say, the share of these uh, companies or of these uh, business fields they represent is going to decrease why, uh, while the uh, on-demand market is going to increase. We don't know yet uh, what this uh, will look like uh, in detail, so the, uh, the line might be slightly different. That might, of course, be different uh, other in rural areas than in urban areas. And on the other hand, of course, all of the affected companies are going to try to increase their share, meaning uh, additional to the new competitors from our side, which you saw on the last slide, are the companies that have been there in the market by now are going to uh, take a part of that on-demand mobility business, which also um, <clears throat> means that they are out of their previous key business. This is one of the uh, motivators for us to get our vehicles connected and to get them into that uh, market, which also means that the classic, uh, uh, the, the classic companies you see in those slides need to open themselves up and need open standards and need open interfaces. Looking at the uh, next slide, this is just another perspective on the, on the last diagram. At the bottom, you see the, what, uh, was, what is now here uh, referred as basics. You see the traditional car OEM business. On top, that's where the forecasts say that there will be a significant increase of demand where we have car as a service, mobility as a service. Car as a service is coming back again to the connectivity topic we already covered, where you add functionalities, digital services to a car to enable car as a service um, to begin with. Therefore, you can then speak about a smart car. It enables services such as car sharing, car sharing or in general being a uh, uh, enabling the concept of car as a service. But what does car as a service or mobility as a service mean? Car as a service is just, I want a car now and I don't want to take care of the rest. I don't want to own it necessarily, I just want to use it. On the other hand, going one step further, further mobility as a service says, I just want to get from A to B, give me a in the best case, a set of options, how I get there, and what's the price for that. Taking this to a, a real-world application that's out there, that's currently being run in Spain, is what we call mini-sharing. Mini-sharing, apart from what you know from the classical car sharing, as you know, drive now, car to go, is where a company operates a fleet and you're basically renting their vehicle. Mini sharing basically says, I bought a Mini and I'm trying to make use of it basically. I'm uh, being enabled to give that Mini to some people I know, I trust, to have them using it instead of uh, having the classical questions if you have a bigger family and one or two cars in general. Where did you park that car and where are the keys? This is what the mini sharing concept um, as car as a service relieves you off uh, because that is all mobile enabled. You have an app on your phone where you control that car with. You can open the app and it allows you to start the engine. Let's have a look at the uh, corresponding uh, user story. As a peer, as the one owning the car, you can invite other drivers. You just add them via the app 
to the cars profile. You have uh, different um, status of the car. So for example, your wife, your husband, you can add as a VIP customer, which means they don't have to ask your uh, permission uh, for each time they use the car. But on the other hand, the normal customer is going to um, book the car saying there is a, a calendar. They see, for example, your neighbor, you're allowed to use your neighbor to car. Uh, sorry, you allow your neighbor to use the car, where you then open the calendar app on your phone, see the times the car is available, and being able to book it. In the next step, whenever the time is near when a customer or the, your friend, your peer, can use the car, he will be able to see where the car is located and being able to open the car and being able to um, uh, start the engine. In the next step, when bringing back the car, you just basically park it within the zone you have agreed on, close the car with the app, and the booking is done from the driver's side. Now we get to the interesting part for the owner, of course. Uh, this is a way you can, uh, for example, use your, uh, decrease your total cost of ownership by just uh, asking the driver to reimburse you for the trip, but that can, of course, also be skipped. This is one of the uh, concepts uh, we, are, we are looking into um, for the car as a service principle from a more personal perspective, not for the company-owned fleets that you have with uh, the classical car sharing. The next slide gives you an overview of uh, how much time a car actually, or should I say how little time a car actually is used. The first line is just your own personal car. You see in the next slide how the increase in percent gets increased, uh, how, the, how great the increase is if you have a shared car. And of course, if the car is automated, where you do not need to take care, you need, don't need to, to organize, for example, key handovers or anything like that, gets increased dramatically again. This is one of the uh, major uh, connections they see how the autonomous and the uh, shared go together. Coming to an end for the ACES strategy and looking into the corporations we are currently in. Those uh, are some of our uh, publicly funded projects. As I already mentioned, Biotope. We also have Socrates and we have Inframix. All of those are meant to increase uh, the car to x communication, so to say, and on the other hand, trying to implementing and proving, testing a or several um, open standards. Socrates uh, is tested in Copenhagen, Amsterdam, Antwerp, and Munich. Um, Inframix is in Spain and in Austria, focusing on uh, autonomous driving on motorways, whereas Biotope, where I'm myself working in, uh, together with Kerry, who is somewhere sitting in the back, yeah? <laughs> and um, Biotope is focusing on Helsinki, Brussels, and Lyon. Of course, those uh, cities aren't uh, the, the, the final stage for the project, but those are our test sites. Have, let's have a closer look on what Biotope is about. Biotope, the statement, don't know if you can read that, is uh, building an IoT open innovation ecosystem for connected smart objects. You see here a picture of a smart city uh, with different aspects. For example, you have the use case safety around schools, which considers uh, the uh, the modes and the ways of transport school children are taking to and from schools. On the other hand, uh, you have smart mobility as a use case where naturally we are working on. Um, you have the smart waste management, uh, which is piloted in Lyon, more to that later. And uh, you have the smart building and equipment. In a classical way or in an not too um, optimal way. 
you would just go there and trying to put a vertical silo, as we call it, around each of those use cases. Meaning you, for example, uh, have your smart home where you have um, the, the IoT devices in your home that you can connect to. Uh, those devices control your home. You might have an app. You might have the um, manufacturer's backend to control those. But there is no connection out of that silo. What we have done in Biotope is trying to get those data connected with, uh, between the certain use cases, so for example, the smart home and equipment, and the smart mobility on the other hand. Let's have a closer look at the um, smart mobility use case, which uh, currently is being tested. Uh, implementation is almost done. Um, it consists of five proof of concepts. The preconditioning, where the car is taken to an, uh, the, the uh, air condition of the car is activated in advance to the driver's arrival to get a comfortable environment for the driver when he arrives in the car. We have the driver identification and data usage. We have the real-time traffic information. We have the smart parking and the smart charging. Um, preconditioning and driver identification and data usage are mostly focusing from our side. They are uh, selected as proof of concepts to show um, the concept of context awareness and uh, context, <coughs> sorry, context sensibilization. Uh, the real-time traffic information is to show the interlink with the other use cases I mentioned earlier. And the smart parking and charging especially is about standardization. If we look at the smart charging, smart parking, you see the architecture overview. Um, and I'm afraid you can't probably see the, the little clouds uh, around the, uh, the, the little clouds representing the, the different partners. So for example, you have one uh, little dot for parking in Helsinki. You have uh, one little cloud for parking energy, which is operating charging poles in Helsinki and uh, many more. The idea here is, as was mentioned earlier, not to force everyone to open up all their infrastructure and all their code. The idea is that there can be a proprietary cloud, but whenever those clouds are connected, that they are uh, connected by interfaces using open standards and therefore uh, supporting people and lowering the, the threshold for people to getting into contact with that data. So for example, uh, when we have the uh, car interacting with the um, charging provider, this goes, what is now here referred as IoT BNB in the, in the middle of the picture, which is a service catalog that allows the car to find parking data that in a city where it never has been before. What you wouldn't want to do here is uh, to program the, the URLs uh, for the parking services provider for the different cities hard into the car, because that just means as soon as the car gets into a new area, it wouldn't know what to do. That's what the, the service catalog is for. On the other hand, when the car is looking for the uh, charging, for example, the communication between the charging pole and the back end, which takes care of the billing of the reservation, is not open to the car because that's just the business of the charging provider and it's not necessary for the car to know. The car only needs to know, is it available? Where is it? Can I use it in terms of compatibility? And um, how to pay for the energy, which, because that only in the end will allow me to charge. You see here uh, the steps we have been taking. Um, to some of you, the OMI ODF standard we are using in Biotope may, may already be familiar. The problem is that people tend to say, for example, with parking, the city do, ho do have open data portals. What is it you are actually going for with, with Biotope? The problem is that open data doesn't necessarily mean that we can understand and interpret the data. Especially with parking, you wouldn't 
think uh, that a car manufacturer has problem interpreting uh, parking data, but it's not always that easy. There are examples out there where the data is available and uh, even is uh, real-time enabled. The problem is it's just some proper proprietary JSON format we cannot interpret. That's where we are going for open standards, so for example, MobiVoc or the OMI ODF standard. This is the uh, coming to that thought of the interface where uh, Kerry is usually uh, using the, the picture of an hourglass, where you have within your islands, can use many standards. At the interface, uh, you use a very restricted, limited set of standards. And on the other hand, for example, the network protocols, you use whatever you need. Coming to the next use case of Biotope, which is a smart waste management, what you see to the right of the map is a bottle bank. And on top of it, you see a small IoT device that just measures the filling grade of the bottle bank and sends that back to the back end of the car. The, uh, not the car, sorry, to the back end of the city. The city uses that data to know when a bottle bank needs to be emptied and as it's open data, you can also visualize that on a map. They plan the most effective routes for their waste trucks around the city to collect uh, the bottle banks that are in need of collection. And this is one of the uh, interlinks that are quite nice in Biotope. What we are looking into is we know where the, car, uh, where the waste truck is and we know where it most likely will stop because it has to empty the bottle bank. If you're driving a BMW, that's most likely not the area you want to go in that very moment because that will uh, prevent you from driving and will just keep you there. This is one of the uh, applications where we can see the connection between the two use cases might be beneficial even if you didn't think in the first place that smart waste management and smart mobility would have something in common. Next thing is our connection between the smart home and equipment and the smart mobility. Again, there are two use cases that are probably not too closely connected, but on the other hand, if you think of the customer, of the end user, he or she has paid a lot of money for his or her smart home and on the other hand for the car. Both are labeled as smart but apparently are too dumb to talk to each other because the problem is the smart home is likely to know that I'm going to leave soon. Why can't it just tell the car? That's what we did uh, within one of these proof of concepts. We have a quite a nice video coming up uh, that has not yet been published but will so in the near future where you use the uh, smart home control app saying I'm leaving home, that obviously triggers the uh, necessary action within the smart home, but on the other hand triggers the preconditioning in the car. So as soon as you walk down to your car, the car will know, it will also derive from uh, the, the circumstances. Um, so for example, what is the weather like if the temperature is between say 12 and 19 degrees, there isn't, uh, there isn't the need to do anything because the temperature in the car is already comfortable. But on the other hand, if the uh, temperature is, say, below 25 degrees, uh, then the car will already have turned on the air condition, uh, which on the one hand is quite comfortable because the car has the right temperature when uh, the person arrives, but on the other hand is also economically because the car is most likely if you're at home and it's an electric car, for example, it is connected to the grid, meaning uh, the time the air conditioning is running while the car is connected doesn't get deducted from the range of your car. This again is uh, one of the use cases you wouldn't uh, have thought of being necessary, but on the other hand is quite a nice uh, idea to show. And these actually leads me to my final statement, which I just uh, chose to use from our members of the board. The future of mobility will be autonomous, connected, emission-free and shared, and it will be geared 
to meeting the individual needs of each and every single customer. Thank you. Uh, in my opinion, uh, so enabling infrastructure in terms of communication. Uh, the vehicle. Yeah, uh, in my opinion, that's that's most uh, crucial because, as I mentioned earlier, it's just not possible uh, to get get a, a fully autonomous fleet without any connection. Um, a couple of questions about the mini-sharing example yeah. that you gave. One is, what's the, what's the motivation for the driver, the vehicle owner, sorry, in, in that, um, in that uh, example? Um, and what technology components are deployed on the car to enable it, uh, and how do you ensure security? Uh, the motivation for the car owner, in my perspective, can be two. One would be if you, for example, use the uh, example of a neighbor again to just get my car used because I will pay for it regardless if I use or if I don't. So if you have your neighbor reimbursing you for the use of the car, that uh, might be interesting for me. And the other thing might simply be convenience, because if you use it, uh, say, within your family or very close friends, uh, then there isn't the, the need to search for the key or search for the car, especially if you have an area where uh, it might be a quite wide area where the car can be parked. And the, the second part was what, what technology components are deployed um, to enable it, and how do you ensure security? Um, there is a... a component um, being introduced uh, into the uh, car at the plant uh, and the connection to the mobile is uh, so the, the the connection between the car and the uh, mobile phone is running via bluetooth low energy and um, as it's being introduced in in the plant and going through the the same steps I would say the uh, security is the same as you have for uh, the irregular car keys. Right, right. Um, so another, another question on security. Um, how are the new and unique security threats in a smart and connected environment being addressed? We've all heard stories of cars being hacked and things like that. I hope not ours, but uh, <laughs> yes. Um, that, that most certainly is an important uh, topic. Um, I'm afraid regarding the uh, autonomous cars, I'm not the specialist my, myself, uh, but there are quite some people working heavily on that. I can show you as much. I'm sure, yeah. um, what are some of the management capabilities in fleet management and car condition monitoring and problem fixing on the fly that have been explored? if any, um, um, management capabilities, so fleet management and car condition monitoring and problem fixing. It's very problem fixing on the fly. Um, I guess if the cars are, I'm, I'm interpreting the question, but I guess if the cars are um, somehow being, being part of a fleet um, that are being shared, um, that may change how the uh, how that fleet is managed and how the cars are looked after in that fleet. Uh, yeah, that definitely is one case. Uh, so I just assume that the, the question refers to the uh, station-based or the, the free-floating car sharing as uh, DriveNow, for example, uh, where you definitely need to, to take care. So with DriveNow, for example, you have um, the, the customer being asked of the uh, condition of the car before starting the uh, trip and afterwards. 
and uh, therefore uh, actions will be triggered if necessary if the vehicle needs to be refueled, repaired or anything. And on the other hand, with uh, drive now, it is the case that uh, if, you uh, if you simply think of refueling, that's also a step uh, the uh, customer can take care about if he, sh he or she wants and uh, will get uh, rewarded with, um, with free uh, driving kilometers or minutes on that. Um, let's see. What data processing capability have you identified both in-car and in-cloud given the heavy volumes and velocity of data? Data, 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 data processing capability. I think there is uh, still much to, to explore on, on that topic, um, but you're, you're right, uh, with the car getting smarter and smarter and the uh, capability uh, for communication increasing, it's always uh, the, the um, possibilities just grow uh, even more than they have in the, in the past. Yeah, and the volume of data goes, yeah. goes up and up. Um, let's see. Uh, what is the mechanism recommended by each platform to expose and consume services available in each platform? And somebody's put, sounds a bit like IT for IT's request to fulfill. Um, that's probably someone from our IT for IT forum. <coughs> but the, the real question is, what's the mechanism recommended by each platform to expose and consume the services available? So for uh, Biotope, this would be our uh, service or data marketplace, the IoT BNB, where you can offer your data, um, putting a price tag to it or don't. But um, in general, that would be the, the place to advertise the, the service or data. Um, how widely are the Open Group's OMI and ODF standards used across the BMW electric vehicle fleet? This is a bit of a, a, a complicated question. Um, at the moment, what we are uh, doing in uh, Biotope uh, has not yet reached the um, productive environment. That's, as you can imagine, uh, a rather uh, complicated uh, process to uh, ensure the compatibility compatibility with all the other components inside the car and within our backends. Okay. So maybe, maybe in the future we'll, I will ask the question again. Um, and finally, what activities are being undertaken by the projects to facilitate the regulatory aspects, such as insurance and traffic offenses of shared vehicles? Well, in, um, that's again the, um, if you're referring to the uh, mini uh, sharing, for example. I guess it could apply to that or maybe even the, uh, the Ride Now. The, uh, yeah, the, the, the Drive Now, Reach Now concept. Right. Uh, it's basically the same for, for all of them. It's just the, the, the different um, uh, views you have to consider. So, for example, if there is a, a speeding ticket or anything with the with the drive now, that goes to the drive now company, uh, basically owning and operating the car, uh, which then will address uh, the the member uh, that has been identified to that um, time uh, using the car. And it's the same with the or the similar to the to the mini sharing. Uh, where also the, the system keeps track of who used the car and when. So if we stay with the uh, example where uh, the family is owning the car and the, or the, the one of the people is using the, uh, the, let's say the head of the family is owning the car and the other members of the family are using it, then the, people, uh, then the person where the, tic uh, the car is registered to will receive the speeding ticket and I think he or she will take care of that ticket as well. Okay, and one more has just come in. Uh, which of the use cases that you described is most advanced in its testing? Uh, of course, smart mobility, because we are in it. Uh, no, uh, I think uh, most of them are, are quite advanced. Um, the uh, smart, mobility, smart mobility use case indeed has been tested uh, successfully in Helsinki. Um, whereas the um, smart waste management, for example, the, the step one where you just um, measure the uh, filling rate 
is, uh, has, already, has also been successfully tested, but that one has another, um, another time frame, another schedule, so uh, there is more still to follow on that one. Okay. Florian, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your uh, contribution and presentation.